for that um, short delay with the technological glitch. Um, so nice to see you all. My name is Christy Omolonic, and I'm the Network Engagement Manager at Children and Nature Network. Again, I'm glad you're all here. Welcome. I am joining you today from the land of the Muncie Lenape people um, in New Jersey. We invite you to share the indigenous history of your location in the chat. If you are not familiar with the history of your location, you can learn about indigenous territories and land with native land map. We just put a link to that in the chat. Today, Laura Milan, CSO for External Relations at the Children and Nature Network, will be having a conversation with Richard Liu, award-winning journalist, author, co-founder, and chair emeritus of the nonprofit Children and Nature Network. In his book, Last Child in the Woods, Richard coined the phase nature deficit disorder and helped launch a global movement to reconnect children to the natural world. For the first half of our event, Laura will ask Richard questions about lessons learned while creating a nature-filled life while writing his book, Vitamin N, which offers 500 ways to enrich the health and happiness of your family and community. Richard will also share some tips for completing the Vitamin N Challenge, an initiative inspired by his book. In case you didn't hear, the Vitamin N Challenge is a commitment to spend more time outside in nature this summer and to share your experience on Instagram using hashtag Vitamin N 2022 to encourage others to spend more time in nature too. We'll be dropping a link to our Vitamin N website in the chat. The second half of our event will be a Q&A with Richard. So save up your questions and put them in the chat when the Q&A starts. We're thrilled to have Richard and Laura join us today. Good afternoon to you, to you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Christy. Hi, Christy, thanks. And hi, Rich. Hi, Laura. Good to see I you. Yeah, I'm glad that Nancy Heron told me that everybody could see me, so I didn't do anything embarrassing. <laughs> all the, the wonders of the Zoom world that we live in. We, we think we all have it down, and then every once in a while, it uh, yeah. gives us, just reminds us that we are all in this together. Um, well, thanks so much, and thanks, Christy, to you and members of our wonderful Children and Nature Network team for hosting and launching and promoting the awesome vitamin N challenge this summer, which really is intended to remind us all uh, to just really be intentional about getting some outdoor, unstructured outdoor time back into our lives, hopefully with the kids we love and care about. Um, and that's kind of what we're gonna talk with you about today, Rich. Um, vitamin N and for nature, I think we all know, um, is, is something that is in short supply these days. And you started talking about this back in 2005, 2006, when you published the book, Last Child in the Woods, which really articulated and kind of named um, this, this problem that you called nature deficit disorder. You identified the fact that in just a few generations, childhood had moved indoors, kids were not spending time outdoors like they used to. Um, and quite a few years have passed. In that time, you wrote another book called Vitamin N that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, but looking back and then looking forward to today, what do you think has changed, Rich, in this world of nature deficit disorder? Are we making progress? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? What's your, what's your sense of that? I, it's hard to measure what we don't have a baseline for. You know, nobody thought to ask this question in the 50s or 60s or 70s uh, in terms of how, how much time kids were spending outdoors uh, and in natural settings. Um, we do know that some things have improved. Um, the research, when I wrote uh, Last Child, I could find about 60 studies uh, that I felt comfortable uh, citing, and I had some good guidance from some folks in the academic world. So I cited the ones that I trusted those studies. I couldn't believe it was only 60 studies, something this large, how the natural world affects child development and our development throughout our lives as, as adults. Uh, it was kind of literally the elephant in the room. And uh, Today, if you go to the Children Nature Network website, uh, childrennature.org, you'll see in the research library that Children Nature Network uh, uh, began to create many years ago, over a thousand studies 
Uh, most of them, uh, actually, I think probably all of them point in the same direction in varying degrees. But the, the message is clear now through an amazing amount of research that um, being outside in nature, having nature experiences is fundamental to our humanity, fundamental to child development and our development as adults. Uh, there are other things that have improved that the, the mainstream medical world is taking this seriously. Uh, I was asked to give the keynote speech in 2010 to the American Academy of Pediatrics and to my surprise. And they took it quite seriously, many of them. Um, a guy named Robert Czar, Dr. Robert Czar went back to DC, he started writing nature prescriptions. It wasn't a brand new idea, but he really accelerated it. Uh, uh, he also organized all the other pediatricians in Washington, DC to do the same thing. And then they did a database of all the parks and outdoor spaces in Washington, DC. So the doc could not only write the prescription, but could turn to the computer and say, uh, family, you've got a, a park a block and a half from your house. I, I think uh, there's lots of other uh, things that one can point to uh, uh, the number of nature-based preschools has mushroomed, has grown a lot in the last few years in the United States. Europe is still ahead of us. Uh, European countries, particularly Northern Europe, have had those for a long time. They're called forest schools, um, but that's changed. I think it's taken much more seriously in education. The um, COVID, the pandemic really accelerated uh, awareness that this was important for our health. And we can talk about that later, but that's been a, a big change most recently. That's great. We see it in the work happening around the world with green schoolyards. And also, um, I wanted to mention your reference to Robert Czar, Dr. Robert Czar. Uh, we just published a story about his work and how the whole Parks RX project, the initiative has expanded and grown to be something now that patients can prescribe nature through his online portal for themselves and then work with their primary care physician to really think about how to incorporate healthy outdoor time into their lifestyle. So there's a story right now, if you uh, go visit childreninnature.org and go to our Finding Nature News page, it should still be living on the homepage. And it's, it's really about the evolution of that Parks RX project. And we, we like to think of that type of work as a systems change. How do we change the big systems that impact children's daily lives? Uh, families, of course, being one of them, but also schools is where they live, where they learn, where they play. How do we push nature into those places, make nature really accessible? That's really the, the, the big mission that we're working toward. Um, Rich, when you and I talked about this uh, event today, you talked about vitamin and the book. And I think, uh, Christy, did you mention the coupon? We uh, if you go on to our vitamin N challenge page right now, you can um, find the wonderful vitamin N book, which I love because it's got big ideas, but it's got also really easy ideas, things you can do. Um, the, I love the subline, 500 ways to enrich your family's health and happiness. It's all about living a nature filled life. But you told me this is not your favorite kind of book to read or your favorite kind of book to write. And so uh, as we all think about how to get more vitamin N this summer, um, what, why did you write this book? Well, first I should add to what I said before that you know, the people that are online today um, are just as important as, I'm sure there are a few pediatricians, but just as important as the policymakers and the pediatricians that uh, all kinds of people are uh, uh, part of this movement that did emerge, but did exist before Last Child. I always say that, you know, I've met people that had, had outdoor preschools 40 years ago, uh, but they weren't getting a lot of attention. Well, now the culture I, th I think has changed enough that we are beginning to see much greater awareness among parents and teachers and others about the importance of this. Um, the reason I, I wrote it, and as you said, this isn't my favorite kind of book to read or to write, was that after Last Child came out and the Children Nature Network was created by some great uh, co-founders, um, uh, I started getting lots of email from uh, people sending their ideas about how to 
how to get their kids outdoors, how to connect their families, not only their families, but their communities, their schools and, uh, you know, the, the, the different institutions in their city, their mayors and all of that. And I, uh, it was stacking up and it was good material. So uh, uh, I felt that that needed to be shared. It wasn't just sent to me. Uh, uh, secondly, I think that um, I became convinced over time, I kind of resisted this idea at the beginning, but I became uh, convinced over time that there was a new generation or two of young parents who, and young teachers too, who grew up not having a lot of experience in nature. And even when they saw some of them, the, 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 the uh, statistics and the studies coming in about the impact on physical and mental health, on cognitive functioning, and they wanted that for their kids. They often didn't know where to start. I mean, their parents probably didn't take them camping. Uh, they, they may have grown up in cities in which there are dense urban cities in which uh, there is nature, but not the same kind of nature that I grew up with. Uh, so uh, I, I came to the conclusion that this book and books like, like it, I've given a lot of blurbs to other books that are like this since, you know, endorsements that they put on their back, back cover. Uh, and I think the more material like this is out there, the better. Yeah, we agree. And thank you for writing it. I know that it's um, been an inspiration for me. I'm a, the parent of a 16 year old uh, and I find it more and more challenging each year. Maybe other parents of teenagers experience this when they're little, you can say, hey, we're going outside. We're gonna go do this great thing and we're gonna go hiking. And I'm just finding it um, a little more challenging to uh, have interest in doing that with mom and also just to find the time, busy lives, busy kids. Uh, and so in pre you know, preparing for this, going back and rereading the book and just again, uh, it's a really wonderful just um, conglomeration is the only word I can think of because the ideas are so broad and varied and so wonderful. And it's a, it's just a great way to think about getting more nature into our daily lives. Um, you mentioned something a little bit ago about the pandemic and we have seen news reports and uh, different studies and things that are indicating that during kind of the height of the pandemic, although we're certainly not out of it yet, that more people were spending time outdoors, uh, partly as a way to stay safe, partly as a way to fill time when they weren't going and doing their usual activities. Um, do you think that that, we've talked about how to maintain that momentum. How do we maintain that interest in being outside? If you could speak to that a little bit and the fact that we also saw some research indicating it was grownups getting outside and maybe not the kids so much. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, early in the pandemic, um, L.L. Bean asked me to talk to their staff, staff via Zoom. And what they told me before we talked was that they had seen, I hope I have the percentage right, either a 400 or 800% increase in the sales of outdoor clothing, outdoor gear. Um, but they had seen a decrease in sales of outdoor clothing and, and gear to children, specifically for children. Um, I think a lot of millennials headed for the parks and uh, but we're not sure whether kids participated that, uh, you know, it's a little too early to, to tell for sure because the studies perhaps that were started aren't fully in yet. Um, we did see though changes in behavior. Um, early in the pandemic, uh, the Los Angeles Times asked me to write an op-ed. It was because the most recent book that I wrote about um, our relationship with other animals. And uh, I had started getting email and phone calls from people who followed Children Nature Network, who followed my books, et cetera, and, uh, and others who didn't know about us, who were looking out the window in, you know, closeted in because of the, the pandemic. They were looking out their window and they, they were noticing birds. Now they'd seen birds before, but they'd not really seen, or at least this is what a lot of the folks said. You know, and they noticed how the, the possum 
walking through their backyard or the coyote and the eye contact they made with that wild animal made them feel. Uh, one of the ideas in uh, Our Wild Calling, which is the recent book, is that uh, we've been, um, medical folks have been talking about an epidemic, a kind of parallel pandemic of human loneliness now for a couple of decades. And they see it, that it's increasing and they associate this increase in human uh, loneliness with some of the same diseases that are associated with smoking and obesity. Um, and there are a lot of reasons given for this, you know, uh, Facebook and, and uh, all of that. We can't blame everything on, on Mark Zuckerberg though. Um, uh, and bad urban design and, you know, where are you gonna walk? Uh, uh, and, and all of those things. It turns out that many of the same reasons, fear of strangers uh, that uh, cause human loneliness are the same reasons. It's, it's almost point per point uh, that, that keep kids indoors, that keep parents keeping kids indoors. Um, and I added another one to that list uh, in our Rock Calling, which is species loneliness. I think there that as a species, and this isn't new, as a species, we are very lonely. We, we are desperate to um, know that we're not alone in the universe. You know, the, the recent uh, photographs from the outer regions of, of space uh, have moved many of us. You know, we are desperate as a species and always have been to not feel alone in the universe. Why else would we look for Bigfoot? You know, why else would we uh, look for intelligent life on other planets? I know we're curious and all that, but I, I think at, at base, we're, we're, we, we don't want to be alone as a species. And the thing about our relationship with nature, and you saw this in the pandemic, people looked out the window and they noticed that there, were, there was wildlife out there, even in suburbs, even in urban neighborhoods, they watched the, you know, the, the uh, raptor making a nest on the window ledge across the street. And they did not feel so alone. They felt comforted by that. They felt solace. And again, this isn't new, but I think during the pandemic, we felt especially that way. Yeah, another thing about the pandemic, it did increase interest in outdoor classrooms and natural play spaces. Um, I think a lot of schools did uh, create outdoor play spaces, obviously because of social distancing, the need for that. Uh, and as it turns out in 1915, we have photographs that, of, of high rises in New York City with play spaces on top of them and classes being held on top of them uh, because of the tuberculosis epidemic. So outdoor classrooms for social distancing is not a new idea either. Uh, I'm not sure how much of it actually happened though. I think some of it did, but the public school districts in particular um, have so much politics involved and so many people battling for funding turf and all of that. And it's not the teacher's fault, it's the, or the administrators, it's the way things are in, uh, in many school districts, not all. So I don't know how fast they moved on that. And we're gonna, have to find out how, whether that idea sticks because this won't be the last pandemic and it's not gonna fully end very soon. Right, I was just thinking as you talked about um, in the mid 1900s, 1915, 1920, um, different kind of pandemics hitting different parts of the world. And we have the New York Times article that published certainly pictures of kids on rooftops going to school, but also out on the docks, along the waterfront. They got really creative about keeping kids engaged in their education outdoors. They're all bundled up and they were having a great time. And we kind of went from that to then some period of time, I think maybe in the 60s and 70s when we started building schools without windows. Yeah. Uh, Right. And um, and now I think hopefully we're starting to come full circle and more and more people across many sectors are really starting to realize how important connection to the natural world is for school children during the day. You know, we have research in our 
research library and help me articulate this so I don't get it quite right, but something to the effect that middle school students who can see nature, who can see trees and greenery outside of their lunchroom windows do better on standardized tests. Just seeing it provides a restorative effect. And can you imagine if you could actually spend some time in it, what that would look like, especially as our children, young people, all people today are really facing a mental health crisis pandemic, war, global climate change, so much um, for kids to, to wrangle today. Um, Rich, you mentioned something just a minute ago about noticing, and I'm going to do a little spoiler alert here. Anyone who's a big Rich Lou fan, um, this might be really interesting. I know you're working on a new book, um, and I'm not going to give you the alleged new book. Do we have another one in the works? No. Um, and it's really about um, uh, what, I guess, what are you learning about how, what happens when we pay attention to what's happening in the natural world? I mean, we know about the health benefits, the academic benefits, but what, as you work on this new book, and I don't want to give too much away, but um, what are you learning as you, you pay attention to what happens when we pay attention to nature? Well, some of this we already know, and this is a more personal book, so I'm adding... Uh, uh, more myself into it, which I find very, very difficult. It's, um, I, you know, I include my own experiences sometimes in books, but this one requires more. And my navel is actually not that interesting. Uh, so in terms of contemplating it. Um, some of this we already know. Uh, when vitamin M came out, uh, ABC asked me to go to a school outside of Atlanta, near Serenby, in Serenby, uh, which is a community one of our board members uh, created. And this school is terrific. Uh, all the, the, the front of each individual classroom, they were separated, uh, opened into the outdoors. There were gardens, there were vegetable gardens. And throughout the woods around it, there were uh, learning trails. And they were teaching these kids everything out there, not just science and not just uh, 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 about nature. And there was this moment where the, the um, ABC reporter with the camera people stopped and we were talking to a group of uh, middle school uh, young ladies, young women. And, uh, uh, he asked them, well, what are you going to be when you grow up? And one of them said, I want to be a writer. And uh, the uh, reporter who reminded me of Ted Baxter, a nice guy, uh, said, um, well, what would, you know, being out here on these learning trails have anything to do with being a writer? And she looked at him very perplexed and said, don't you understand? Out here, everything is connected. And I about jumped out of my skin because that, that's so profound, that's so good. And um, so when we pay more attention to nature, we pay more attention to everything. We see the, how the dots are connected or we, we sense it. Um, you know, the, the forest therapy now is, has caught on to a degree. Um, and um, I went on a forest therapy uh, thing near where I live on Vulcan Mountain in Julian. And I was very uh, interested in how people responded when they went out to, you know, pick a tree and learn from it. And I know this sounds real new agey, but it's, it's pretty great. Um, they would come back to the circle, the participants. And I noticed they would begin to talk in the form of parables or fairy tales. And I wondered, is this where fairy tales came from? You know, when you finally notice and play, pay attention in nature, it touches something deep in our species. Um, I think also, and this is a paradox, my wife and I moved to the mountains east of San Diego about three years ago. And, you know, when Thoreau moved to uh, or spent all that time at Walden Pond. He actually got away from the industrial age for a while. One moves out to natural, more natural rural areas in the United States and around the world. And there is no escape 
from climate change and biodiversity collapse. This is different than it was in, in Emerson's and Thoreau's era. In some ways it's more painful because you pay more attention to it. And I, all around here, the oaks are dying. In three years, all these giant oaks are, are dead. And the beetle that, that um, thrives in pandemic, in, um, in a drought, and this is the worst drought I think California's had in 12, 1200 years. Uh, they attacked the big majestic 200, 300 year old oaks first. So you can't escape this. This is not an intellectual construct now climate change. And I think increasingly, certainly the people in Europe right now, uh, in, in England and in, 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 in London and Paris are feeling the effects. And um, so that this is a double-edged thing. When you pay more attention in nature, it forces you to feel what these vast environmental changes are doing to the species around us and to us. On the other hand, I have a theory that the best way to deal with grief is to feel it and then to move beyond it. But you have to feel it first. You have to acknowledge it. Um, and I'm, I'm working out some ways that people might be able to, to have more of a sense of peace, not not to the degree that they become complacent about these environmental issues. We've got to do far more, far more, but uh, to at least be able to uh, still find joy in nature. Absolutely, and that is a lot of why we're uh, hosting the Vitamin N Challenge to reconnect to the natural world, to encourage us all again with the kids we our kids or the kids we know and care about, maybe the kids we teach or care for in a, a home-based daycare, whatever that is, to help children experience the joy, the wonder, the awe of nature with just a little more regularity in their lives. Um, Rich, before we move to a Q&A with you, I just want to acknowledge, it's been fun to see in the chat, we have a lot of people joining us today and I saw someone sign, I'm coming to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota, land of the Dakota people, but I saw people signing in from Budapest and Brazil and Boulder, Colorado. I mean, everywhere and in between. And we're so thrilled to have you. Thanks to everyone for joining to spend this time with us today. And the chat looks really active. And uh, I think our team members are trying to respond quickly to all of your requests. Um, but we'd like to open it up now uh, for a Q&A with Rich. And we're gonna do this. Um, Christy, I think you gave instructions. People should put their questions in the chat. And then Christy's gonna chat them to me and I'll read the questions to you, Rich. And I wish we could get to them all, um, but we won't, we're gonna do our best. And we'll get started now. There is one question in the Q&A box that I'll pull, it's directed right to you, Rich. Um, and I also saw one of our sort of vitamin N challenge super users, I believe Suzanne Heaton is in the mix and she's just been doing a wonderful job uh, talking about the challenge, sharing her experiences doing the vitamin N challenge in our group called the Trailhead. We, the Children in Nature Network hosts a free online community called The Trailhead. You can find it on our website and I bet someone will also throw that in the chat while I'm talking, um, where you can find uh, peers, leaders, advocates, practitioners, parents, you name it, um, other people like you who are interested in this topic who really want to uh, increase connection to nature for children, their children, and or other children around the world. Um, and we have a great vitamin N. It's a really fun group to, to be involved with right now. Um, so thanks, Suzanne. I can see you in there. And Rich, this question is coming to you. Um, with local elders, we are training Indigenous youth here in Mi'kmaq. Nova Scotia. I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm sure, but it's in Nova Scotia, uh, to be earth walkers and to lead our less green, more green program. They're working with the park prescription at Dalhouse University. Is there a way that we can kind of connect youth, Canadian non this Canadian nonprofit and Children in Nature Network for some kind of certification? Oh, or to enhance their options. Boy, Maybe I'll tackle that first. It's something we talk a lot about. How can we continue to expand what we do to create things like certifications? I, we're not quite there yet, but I wonder, Rich, if you'd like to speak to just the work that they're doing, working with elders and training indigenous youth to be 
earth walkers. That just sounds amazing. Carrie, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, well, first, I neglected to say I'm in the, the land uh, of the Kumeyaay, and uh, uh, they're still quite active here. I mean, not still, but they've always been active here and uh, live not too far from here. There are several reservations. In fact, San Diego County has more very small reservations than any county in the U.S. I think that's, that's right. Uh, I think that sounds terrific, and I wish there were programs like that all over the, uh, the world. Uh, indigenous knowledge is uh, undertapped, and I know in Canada, where you're from, there's a great uh, book. It was actually a workbook for classes that was done in cooperation with First Nations people. And I'm having trouble remembering the name of it, but I, but I quote from it and interviewed the author or one of the many authors uh, in Our Wild Calling. Uh, and uh, he, this is extraordinarily important. Sometimes it's difficult because, uh, uh, you know, it, it, we have to be very careful about cultural appropriation, which means you have to give full credit to ideas that, you know, the Europeans did not bring here. And uh, uh, and that's very that's very important. I, I I think it sounds like a great idea to begin to work with us. The certification we've talked about different kinds of certification. It's never quite uh, gotten off the ground, but I think your question is going to stimulate that a little bit. Yeah, Carrie, I'll keep this information. This is Carrie Crofton coming to us from Nova Scotia. I'll I'll keep your information and just stem um, as we have conversations about this. Maybe we'll be in touch uh, to, to explore this a little more. Uh, Rich, we have a question from Zena Nippert. Uh, if you had, to, this is this is gonna tax all of your best writing magic. Uh, if you had to convince a school district to embrace nature-based learning using one phrase, what would that be? Well, I couldn't just use one phrase. I'm a writer, I've got it. Throw as many words as possible. <laughs> My editor will tell you I throw too many words out there. Uh, she's always asking me to write shorter. Um, uh, I, you know, it depends on this, the school district. I'll tell you the the studies being done in Massachusetts and Chicago about standardized testing. You know that it improves standardized test scores that moves it into an arena that they take very seriously, maybe too seriously. But uh, I think that's one way, but you know, there, there are different kinds of school boards, different kinds of school administrators. And certainly there are a lot of teachers out there who understand this intuitively. Uh, I learned pretty early when I went out and gave my sermonettes around the, the country um, that almost always there'd be one or two teachers who would come up to me sometimes more and they would say you know I don't care what the principal says I'm I've been getting my my students outdoors for years and I'm not going to stop and I uh, I began to think of them as the natural teachers and they weren't always the environmental ed teacher they were the English teacher who would take their students out and write poetry under the trees uh, they were the science teacher that actually thought that creek at the end of the schoolyard, that little rivulet of water had some use for education. They'd mm -hmm. take their students down and get their hands wet and their feet muddy. Uh, uh, there are those teachers, they've been out there all along. Um, I've always hoped that they would create a network, a large community of those teachers and also natural administrators who are interested in this and make it happen in their schools. Uh, I happen to think that the most effective social change is the kind of change that is contagious. It doesn't wait for a big bureaucracy to change. It begins to change person to person and somebody sees somebody else having some success down the hall and maybe they get an award from the Children Nature Network and they say, I, I'm interested in that. Can you tell me about it? getting kids outdoors. So a lot of this has to be, I think at the grassroots, not all of it, we need to change systems, but 
uh, uh, teachers, parents, parents who start family nature clubs, the family nature club here, which is one of the ideas in, in uh, um, uh, vitamin N. Uh, the last I heard had something like 3000 member families, families, not individuals. And that's just over a few years. And what these groups are, are, um, you know, 3,000 families don't show up at the park together at the same time. That could be a problem. Um, but it's a pool that families can dip into and say, does anybody want to go to the park with us on Saturday or uh, work in, in our garden or whatever? And several families will answer. And so one, two, five, six families, sometimes 20 families will get together. And it deals with their sense of isolation. It deals with their sense of safety. It gives the, uh, at least the perceived sense of, of it being safer. And it brings parents together who know something about, who were raised by parents perhaps, who got them outdoors or have learned since with parents that struggle to know that because they didn't get that when they were kids. This is the kind of contagious uh, social change that I think we need in the schools, in the families, in our neighborhoods, in addition to the big changes that can happen if a mayor takes interest in this. And we're seeing, um, as you know, uh, a lot of movement with our cities project, which is in league with the National League of Cities, which is represents something like 18,000 mayors and other urban uh, leaders who are working to make cities more nature rich and better places for kids and nature. So it, this change has to work on many layers. I've answered that with too many words, haven't I? <laughs> so that was not one phrase, but I did want to mention for the uh, <laughs> that Zena who asked that question. Uh, if you're not familiar on our website in the resource hub, we do have some infographics uh, about the benefits of green schoolyards and outdoor learning. And I think you would find some kind of short usable phrases and facts within those, just childrenandnature.org, go to our resource hub, go to the school section and you'll find those. They look at the academic benefits of learning outdoors, uh, the ac academic, mental health, physical health, social, emotional learning, um, so some really, really wonderful resources there. Um, this is really interesting. Mark Campbell is asking, and we just posted something about this on social, social media. Uh, there's a, been an observation made that we are starting to replace words about the natural world with tech terms in the dictionary. Um, that feels like going in the wrong direction. Uh, thank goodness for this vitamin N challenge. We all have our work cut out for us, but is that something you want to comment on. I wonder if that just reflects where society is right now. I mean, we are living in a Zoom world, whether it works or not all the time. Um, yeah. Yeah, is that something you have a thought about? Yeah, and by the way, I'm glancing at the comments and there's some terrific ideas coming in in the comments and I hope we can save. We do. All of this. Uh, some great stuff. And a lot of teachers, by the way, are saying they did get their kids outdoors uh, in their schools did have outdoor classrooms and that's heartening. Um, there, I can't remember, I'm just terrible on names, but there's a, a British author that has done a really good book on the disappearing uh, nature words being replaced often by technological words. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that, is, that, that is troubling. Um, uh, and, you know, the only antidote to that is to bring nature to the surface in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, particularly in higher education, which really sets the standards for uh, high school and middle school. And I think sets those standards too much perhaps. And we've seen a shift away from traditional studies of biology and zoology and, and all that and, and field studies, which depend on on knowing words about nature. A shift from that to microbiology and creating critters in the lab that can be marketed, both by the professors who are coming up with them, who somehow interestingly end up on the boards of the companies that produce them. And the big research institutions, often publicly funded, get a cut of that profit. So and this has been told to me by several 
really important scientists who say they're, they're worried about the shift in higher education away from the hands-on, eyes-on, paying attention, personal connection uh, with, with the natural world. And that's, that's the wrong kind of contagion. I was thinking, Rich, about your conversation. Uh, for those of you who are with us in Atlanta in May for our international conference, it was amazing. We hosted a live remote conversation with Dr. Jane Goodall and Rich. They had a wonderful conversation. And one of the things that I found so fascinating about that you talked about the way we learn about nature and that it's often this kind of goes to this, you know, replacing nature words with tech words, but you talked about the way you and Jane both, we learn about nature often in a very empirical way. We learn the pH of water and how to measure things. When in fact, what Jane Goodall did is she sat and she noticed, she watched the behavior of chimps. She learned about their personalities. You've talked about that too. I wonder if that might be just a kind of a nice part of our conversation to kind of move towards the end of this event, but do you? Whatever. Yeah, and I noticed, I noticed a comment from uh, Mark Campbell that is true. He says, seems as though it should never have, have to be these and those words yeah. or those words that there is certainly room for both. Absolutely, the, the, you know, the hard science, the, the uh, laboratory words as well as the, the field studies words. Uh, and it's not only the words, of course, it's not just naming things. Uh, um, Jane Goodall was terrific. I had a great time with her. We talked for about an hour and she was in London and uh, on Zoom and I was in Atlanta at our national conference. Uh, and uh, we had a great conversation and she's, the more I learn about her, the more impressed I am with her. Yeah. It was because of her work early on, not entirely her work, but she was extraordinarily influential, that scientists began to move away from this idea that animals are, you know, other animals other than us are essentially kind of machines and that they're not sentient. And uh, that prejudice was very much in science for a long, not, with all scientists, but it was pretty dominant for a long time. And she began to notice emotions and communication among chimps. She also noticed some negative things. Uh, for instance, it had been assumed all along that chimps were cute and, and they were kind and they were better than human beings, of course, but it turns out they, they make war. And sometimes they're cannibals and they're not nice all the time. So she broke the ground in several areas and she did it by sitting there or walking among them and watching and paying attention, making lots of notes. There are people all over the country right now who keep nature journals that are essentially doing the same thing. Um, I was at a, uh, a nature center in the upper Midwest it was a wonderful nature center. It was surrounded by lots of wildland. Wolves would come through this particular, uh, not the nature center itself, but the land around it. Um, and there was a, a young woman there who had um, a, a uniform on. She was a terrific environmental education teacher. And I had learned that there was a pond on the grounds of the nature center. It was the most popular thing for parents and kids and teachers who were visiting to go down to. And they get down there and the frogs would all disappear and go into the water. And uh, I said, do you use that pond, you know, to teach about nature? And she says, oh yes, we have them go down and we, we do science experiments. We test the pH of the water. We, um, all kinds of very uh, scientific experiments which are great, it's terrific. But I asked her, um, do you ever take the kids down there and the parents and just sit and wait for the frogs to come back up so that you can kind of feel what it must be like to be a frog and take that in and all of the other life 
in that pond and around it and on it. And she said, no, we do pH experiments. And the guy standing next to me um, later told me, you know, I don't think she could hear your question because she is under so much uh, pressure from state standards, uh, school standards, et cetera, for the kids that come here to do, there to do very specific things that have to do with testing. Uh, this may be too harsh of a judgment on my part, but clearly she was, uh, that the idea of just being in nature was not good enough for, certainly it would have been for her, I'm sure. I, I got to know her, she was wonderful. But so many of our standards have nothing to do with truly connecting and appreciating nature, you know, and feeling what I describe in our wild calling, um, feeling the habitat of the heart. I think there are two habitats. There is the physical natural habitat that we spend a lot of time trying to preserve and teaching our children about as we should. And then there's this habitat of the heart. And that's the difficult to explain sense of connection and communication we have with the conversation that is going on all around us. And the more that uh, we know about animal and tree communication, plant communication, a huge amount of new research has been done on this, the more we know we're not alone in the universe. Uh, we're surrounded by a great conversation that we can participate in if we pay attention. Um, and some of us noticed that and heard that conversation during the pandemic more than perhaps we did before. But those two kind, those two habitats, the habitat that it, of the natural physical world and then the habitat of the heart, if one of those habitats goes, so does the other one. And I think so many of the people who are online now are doing both. They're talking and teaching and being in the natural physical world, but they're also aware of the habitat of the heart. And they're passing that on to their children and their students. That's a really wonderful gift. And we hope our vitamin N challenge, the book vitamin N and resources that we all share some of the wonderful ideas in the chat. Um, can just inspire us all a little bit as summer continues. Um, we're almost at time. I wonder if we we started a couple minutes late, maybe we'll just end just a few minutes late, but we'll end pretty close to the hour here. Um, and have Christy kind of wrap up with a little bit more details on our vitamin N challenge. But Rich, what you're what you're talking about also speaks to a theme that I've heard you talk a lot about, and that's reciprocity. Um, the benefits we get from nature, but what are we giving back? The, we really believe strongly at the Children in Nature Network that access to nature is a basic human right of every child. Uh, parallel with that, what are the rights of nature and how can we think about that as we all work to get a little more vitamin N? Um, well, th th there is work being done internationally on the human right to nature. And this started several years ago um, I've written about that idea in the last three books. And uh, uh, basically that if E.O. Wilson is correct, the great scientist, late great scientist at Harvard, that we are hardwired to have an affiliation with the rest of nature, that it goes very deep, that this is in us, this is part of our humanity. If he's right about that, and if over a thousand studies have been collected uh, on our website are correct, that this has profound implications, not for every child, not for every person, but certainly for most, uh, that nature is fundamental to our humanity, fundamental to our development and our kids. Anything that fundamental, human beings have a right to. Now, having said that, that right depends also on the rights of nature to be, to exist. You know, uh, David Orr, who has been on our board 
uh, says, you know, the human right to nature is the most basic right. Because unless nature, and, and, and nature survives, unless nature survives, it will survive in some form. But unless our connection to nature survives, then all of these other rights have no foundation. They have no roots. Um, there are, uh, there's a river in New Zealand that the um, indigenous people uh, there and others have fought for a long time to preserve. And a few years ago, um, it was declared that that river has rights. You know, if the Supreme Court can say that corporations are people, which they, it did say, the Supreme Court said that a few years ago, and certainly we can consider rivers and animals and forests to have certain rights to exist. Absolutely. Uh, not every tree, but there is a, there, there isn't, there is a right to exist. They have a right to exist, we do. And this river, they declared this. And it's interesting how they explain this because they say, you know, the water going down that river has a right to be there and it nourishes all of the plants and all of the animals and all of the people, also animals, who live along that river. Their livelihood, their lives depend on that river continuing to flow and to be healthy and not to be polluted. That's a way to see our rights as integrated. Um, in the, our wild calling, I talk about what I call the reciprocity principle. And basically, I think that we have to have a, a way to think about nature that it's not just the health that it gives us. It's not just the resources we extract, including the resource of health. Um, it is much more than that. And that for every thing we receive from nature, we should give at least as much back. For every acre we take, we should give at least another acre back, including creating it where there hasn't been nature in a long time, for instance, in cities. Um, and I know defining nature is a whole other discussion, but we are part of nature and that's part of this issue. For, you know, for everything we receive, for every dollar we spend in our schools on technology, on computers, as we should, it's important. For every dollar we spend on the virtual in our schools, we should spend at least another dollar on the real on natural play spaces, on getting kids outdoors and learning not just the numbers, but the spirit of what surrounds us. Um, and uh, to do this enough so that we no longer feel alone. Thank you so much. And it's just been so wonderful to watch the chat. Someone did just post it apparently Ecuador, I think I knew this, was the first to grant nature constitutional rights. And there's a link there included and I'm gonna have to go back and read that. That sounds amazing. Um, uh, Rich, we are at time and I just really wanna thank you. It's always so great to have you spend your time. You're so generous with your time, both to our organization and to the movement and to people who um, I know we'll come away from this feeling inspired. So thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to toss it back to Christy. Who will talk Before a little you do, thank you, uh, Laura and Christy, and to the Children in Nature Network, of which I'm still quite active. Um, and thanks for all of these great comments, so many great ideas, and, uh, and for all the work that many of you are doing to connect kids and yourselves to nature. Uh, I've always said that this is sacred work that you're doing in the, in the broadest definition of sacred. Yeah. We certainly see that in the chat. Thanks to everyone. I want to echo that as well. Um, and Christy, I'm going to hand it back to you and Rich, just really, again, extending our deepest gratitude. And it's just always, it's always inspiring, interesting, fun, intellectually challenging, uh, even if you can't 
just do it in just one phrase. It's always really wonderful to have you with us. So Christy, back to you. Yes, um, ditto to all of that. Thank you so much, Richard and Laura for joining us today. Um, I've taken away so many great nuggets of information and inspiration. Um, and as already had been mentioned, um, so inspiring to see all of those in attendance and all the work that people in our network are doing to connect children to nature. Um, so thanks to all of you. Um, I'm gonna put a link in the chat about um, our vitamin N challenge. I encourage you to all jump in and um, start taking the challenge if you haven't started already. It um, officially runs through August 31st, but it's really open-ended um, and it's really simple. You basically just need to choose your challenge, make a plan and share your experience. And on our website, we have a lot of great resources, including uh, previous articles from Richard, an excerpt of the vitamin N book, a pledge, trackers, and also a coupon um, that is good through the end of the month for all of Richard's books um, through Algonquin. So um, I'll put that in the chat. So thank you to everyone. I hope to connect with you all um, on social media and uh, email and um, on our website and um, Hope to see you all again soon.